Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We're an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And we're here in the Greenwich Village apartment of Vivian Gornick uh, with Vivian, a wonderful person who I've been meaning to have on for a long, long time. Uh, she's a fabulous writer. She's also a memoirist who helped to bring back the genre of memoir and really make it a very popular genre, uh, the essay form, which I think um, people like Montaigne and Emerson made it popular. Then there was a big gap for many centuries Vivian. until Vivian. And Vivian came along and, and right. And so, <laughs> and, uh, so Vivian wrote this book called Fierce Attachments in 1987, a memoir about her and her mother. So let's begin with that. Let's begin with that book. And we're just going to have a rambling, hour-long dialogue. And this is going to be like, you know, Vivian Gornick for dummies, okay? Yeah. Vivian Gornick 101, all right? We want to touch all the major bases with your feminism, with many aspects of your very interesting life here, and also your recent book, The Odd Woman in the City, where you talk about your interactions on the streets of New York and your relationship to New York. So there's so much to talk about. But let's begin with Fierce Attachments in 1980 a story about you and your mother. Um, what made you write that book? Oh, what made me write the book? Yeah. Um, well, I'd been a journalist for a long, very long time, and um, and suddenly I was I found myself feeling tired of being a stranger in other people's lives. I felt like becoming a, a less of a stranger to my own life. Uh, I, I, it's hard to describe why. I'm sure the feminist movement had s s more than a, a bit of influence. What came, began stirring in me, the sensation, the realization that my talents would lie with nonfiction, not fiction, but that I had stories to tell. So that combined and led you to memoir, right? So these stories that I tell in Fierce Attachments are stories I've been telling most of my life to one person or another, who was always saying to me, oh, that's a novel. And then, but, but I couldn't write a novel. Mm. Turned out I could not write a novel. Mm. Then when I hit on memoir, my imagination uh, was freed. So it wasn't just uh, that this book is about myself and my mother. It's about myself and my mother and a woman who lived next door to us, Nettie, and how the real story was how these two women between them made me a woman. That is what the times seemed to call for and what I felt respond I was responding to. So out of that came Fierce Attachments. At first, I thought... I would just tell the story straight. This woman moved into our building when I was eight years old. It was a tenement in the Bronx. In the Bronx. I grew up it's in the Bronx. Uh, so oh, I grew up in a tenement building in the East Bronx. Mm -hmm. And when I was eight years old, this woman moved in. Uh, and she and my mother were as different as two women could be. Mm -hmm. um, not to go into too much of that here. But between the two of them, I was growing up. Uh, and learning what was important, how you were to negotiate life as a woman. Um, with the woman next door, it was all sex. With my mother, it was all romance. But either way... Oh. <laughs> what a combination. <laughs> yeah, okay. it was lethal. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But either way, a man was at the center. <laughs> you had to get a man. Had to you get had to have a husband. Okay. You had to, yeah. You know, that that was ultimately um, the, the the deepest message, uh -huh. and it was essentially around that um, that that combination of thought and feeling that the book took shape, yeah. and that is the story of fierce attachments. Um, yes, yes. 
But it's, it's interesting because it's also a story from what I heard about it. I haven't read it yet. It's a book that's on my list to read. I have all my Vivian books that I would like to read. That you broke away from your mother and you founded your own identity. Sometimes families can smother us and then we have to escape that and really go for our own dreams. And especially, especially all the time, right? Yeah. Especially if you're an intellectual and you say that your family were urban peasants in the Bronx. That's right. Yes, of course, the story is a coming-of-age story, which is always a question of leaving home in every way imaginable. Um, I started to say, and forgot, actually, uh, that I started to tell the story of my mother and myself and the woman next door uh, like an ordinary narrative from the past. But in, in a little while, I discovered that I had a lot of unfinished business with my mother, which I could not quite figure out. And then by accident, I discovered the, um, the device of walking with my mother in this, which we actually did, and of using those walks uh, to describe, uh, to ma to, I made use of those walks to describe where we were at the moment I was writing. Well, I was in my 40s and she was in her 70s. And then going back into the past so that to to try to understand mm. the women who were walking now. Mm. So the book took that structure, which what which is what made it a New York book as well as a coming of age book and as well as a mother daughter book, because it's interspersed with all these walks that she and I take and the adventures that we ourselves have on the street at the time that we are the age we are. And then moves back into the past so that the two sets of women, the yeah. two in the past and the two on the street now, account for each other, to each other. And yes, the underlying thesis of it is me struggling to get out from under, to, to, to walk away from my mother um, in terms of my own development. Yeah, that's it. So there's a psychological side to it. How did your mother? Re how did your mother react to the book? She reacted uh, the way she was, which was extremely volatile, very volatile. At first, she read it and she said, "You have told the truth." Then she read it and she said, "You have held me up to ridicule. Now the whole world knows you hate me." Oh, then, oh, yes. after a while, yeah, yeah. she got into the celebrity of the book and she began walking around New York signing it. <laughs> you made her famous. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Ma, you can't do this. You didn't. You, why not?" She said. I said, "You didn't write the book." She said, "Well, without me, there was no book," <laughs> which was undeniable. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So now suddenly you become famous when this book comes out, right? What was it like and how did this book sort of break through the genre categories and be, you know, recognized as some new form of of literature? Like how, what was it like for you? How did it feel to when the book came out? Fierce attachments and now you're on the book tours and they're talking about this new genre. <laughs> um, that is a very hard question to answer, always a very hard question to answer. How do I feel about this, that? Let me say this. When Isaac Bashevis Singer uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize, um, a, a lots of reporters stuck this microphone in front of him and said, Mr. Singer, did this make you happy? And Singer said, yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Uh, three weeks later, another reporter said, Mr. Singer, does this make you happy? And he said, listen, how long can I be happy? <laughs> That's me, <laughs> I'm afraid. Okay. Um, I was very surprised and gratified by it. I did not think I had done anything so original. It was, it was a form whose moment had come. I was not hardly discovering memoir writing, but it was a time in our general life when storytelling in, through fiction was not being found deeply satisfactory. It was a time when novel writing as, um, as the chief form to which people uh, both responded and aspired um, was, had long been losing its cachet. Um, 
every critic in the world is going to come down on this, but uh, it had, and stories from life, quote unquote, were mm -hmm. beginning to um, replace the desire both to write and to read um, oh. literature. It's the rare memoir that achieves literature. Mm -hmm. Most memoirs are um, confessional, okay. therapeutic, mm -hmm. uh, sociological. Mm. Um, it's the rare one. I, I must say I am deeply proud and happy that I do believe I made a piece of literature with fierce attachments. Mm. And that uh, I can see, and, and many others have too, but I do believe I was one of the first in our moment to achieve that through a story that's been told uh, one way or another by many other people. Well, I want to say, Vivian, that you make me happy. Oh, you make me happy because as a writer myself, and I feel like this is in part a collegial conversation because I'm also a writer and I teach writing, um, I, I always felt insecure about being able to write a novel. You know, it seemed like such a, such an unreachable, such a thing that, and then they have these MFA programs where everything is so structured and rigid and you have to workshop your piece and it seems like everyone sounds like everybody else, you know. But when I, when I started to write about my own life, I found it very liberating to write this kind of form and to see it recognized as literature. So thank you for that. Thank you for the work you did in that. And also you wrote a book specifically about this, predicting the end of the romance novel or, or, or diagnosing this situation. Uh, I forget the exact title. Uh, let, let me see. I did take my notes. I, I brought some notes with me here. And if I could uh, just uh, see. Um, ah. So, okay, you wrote in 1997 a book called The End of the Novel of Love. The End of the Novel of Love is a collection of essays. It's, um, and at its heart is the, um, the, con the declaration mm. on my part mm -hmm. that romantic love as a metaphor, as a great metaphor for novel writing is over. That's the meaning of the end of the novel of love. Not that I think novels, novel writing is over. Okay. It is that um, for at least 150 years, romantic love was seen as a great metaphor at the center of, um, of great novel writing. And uh, my belief, not my belief, uh, my observation is that um, in our time, um, the actuality of, it, of the experience of love has, has been replaced. It can't be a great metaphor anymore because we all have too much experience. You could not, no longer believe that love, romantic love, is a source of salvation in a life. That's what that is all about. Fascinating. Now, you also wrote a book titled The Men in My Life. Yes. And I thought, oh, this is going to be one of those juicy tell-all <laughs> memoirs of your love life and, and boyfriends. And they, but it actually is a book about the male writers who influenced you. And when I took a look at the list, I was excited to find Philip Roth and Saul Bellow, yes. two of the writers who have very influenced me also. Talk about those two writers. Well... Philip Roth and um, Saul Bellow are two of the most famous Jewish American writers, um, and they have been extraordinarily influential on American literature. No one can ever take away from them, or would want to, myself included, the, uh, the influence, uh, the power, uh, the changes they have wrought, the way they have absolutely changed the American language. Um, so that part, <laughs> I exceed. I exceed too, uh, with pleasure. Um, however, what has gone along with that is a huge amount of misogyny. Every, each of these writers have been uh, have been and are um, uh, astonishingly misogynistic in my view. And the piece that I wrote about them, it was meant to say that 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 hatred of women. Um, has been a great uh, deterrent for them. I think it has um, 
prevented their work from growing and changing. Their work has become, was arrested mm. in the sense that it depends to a large degree, many people will argue this, but it's my belief, to a large degree on misogyny. Wow. So. So that sort of yeah, makes, it, well, I've read the books too, and I could yeah. see like Portnoy's complaint, he talks about the monkey and things every like. Every single novel, when it's not, no. every single novel uh, is, is a monkey. Have you had uh, interactions with Philip? No. With Roth himself? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so this makes me think about your feminism. Yes. Okay, and this, uh, you wrote an article for the Village Voice in 1969, which was a seminal piece, uh, The Next Great Moment in History is Theirs, right. which actually, the, the piece itself helped to create an organization or bring radical feminists together. So that was a piece of writing that actually created a community in some way? Oh, I wouldn't say that. I was responding to a moment that oh. m many, many women were just sharing. Okay. It was the beginning of second wave feminism, oh. and I was one, indeed, I consider myself a founding mother of that movement, oh. in that uh, wow. uh, none of this can be news to you, Ken, is it? Yeah. Really? I'm to sorry. you too? I'm no. Sorry. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, Vivian Good. <laughs> I'm one of the dummies. All right, I'm okay. One of the dummies. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that piece was yeah. part of a moment which uh, many, many people were suddenly looking at the culture differently. We were seeing things we had never seen before, yeah. and um, and that was a piece, that was that was indeed a seminal piece. But it was part of a general movement that was that was uh, taking place very visibly, very prom increase with increasing prominence. Uh, well, the first time I ever saw Gloria Steinem. Uh, she was at the new school with bell hooks and they were in a dialogue uh -huh. and after that I just have to approach this woman and, and express my thanks to her. I gave her a hug and I thanked her for my mother and grandmother who both grew up in the pre-feminist era yeah. and my grandmother Elsie Hor Hor well, formerly Elsie Horza, then Elsie Martucci went to Walton High in the Bronx so I have that Bronx background but neither my uh, grandmother or uh, mother uh, went to college my, my grandmother uh, was supposed to go to Columbia University Teachers College and her grandfather, her grandfather said he was going to pay for it and then at the last minute he pulled the funding out and that influenced her life. So yeah, so feminism, I'm a champion of feminism myself and I see... Are you like to hear that, Claudia? <laughs> yes, yes that Claudia, you yeah, yeah. glad to hear that? <laughs> Good. And, and then the other thing, uh, on our show we featured as a guest Molly Haskell, uh -huh. who's a feminist uh, film critic, also started at the voice, um, and Harriet Fraud, who considers herself one of the founding mothers of feminism also. Harriet Fraud, she's a psychotherapist and an activist based in New York, and she's on the left also. So, uh, so what, what, what do you think is happening with feminism today? What do you think is happening? With not, much, not much, not much. Not much? With the Me no, Too movement oh, well, in that. full stride? Okay, so that, talk about What do you that. mean? Okay. <laughs> All right, well, that's... Wow, well, I would say... But until Me Too, it was kind of in... Social change yeah. takes forever. Okay. It is not something that happens overnight. When we exploded in the 70s and the 80s, uh, in our ideological youth, we thought, wow, this is a revolution, and it will be accomplished overnight. But in time, we came to see that the habits of thousands of years could not be overturned overnight. And change has come very, very, very slowly. The Me Too movement, which has just erupted, and shows us that sexual predation, which we named fully 40 years ago, remained as powerful a presence in our culture almost as if it, the last 40 years had not happened. That is a measure of how difficult social change is to um, affect. The young women who suddenly exploded with the Me Too movement suddenly felt free to name sexual predation in their huge numbers, have done so because they have been influenced osmotically by our activities, by the feminist movement of 40 years ago. So you cannot say that nothing happened. What you had was an explosion of social right. 
revolutionary thought and activity 40 years ago, which then dies down because people can't stay activists all their lives. But slowly, 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 all those thoughts and feelings are permeating the general life. We put into their heads, into the heads of younger people, men and women alike, sentences they never could have had be in their heads before we opened our mouths in the 1970s. Now, 40 years later, you have another explosion. It's hardly the end of things. It's hardly the end of a culture in which men see women instrumentally. That is what the Me Too movement is all about. It has revealed the deep extent to which men continue to see women instrumentally and women continue to react, yeah. often seeming complicit. Wow. Got that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. In other words, yeah. there's no other way to be. What you have is, the, we're, we're often being, um, um, women are often being questioned now and uh, pointing to women whose behavior seems questionable. Yes, he, he um, he tried to rape me, but I still went on working with him. Well, why did you go on working with him? Well, what else was there to do? That's a culture. That's a whole culture that needs to change. Men need to see women differently, and women need to be seen differently. And then everyone will act differently. Mm. And the Me Too movement just simply has turned over that rock mm. and let all those worms you know, sp which are morphed into snakes, mm. come out again, mm. and that's where we are now. So lots of people are acting badly because it's it's a really bad situation. But uh, for me, it's a thrill to see um, sexual predation itself named all over again with so much power and so much effect and so much unbelievable payback, I have to say. Yeah. It's astonishing. That's the most astonishing thing. 40 years ago, you could have named all the Charlie Roses in the world and, and the Harvey Weinsteins and nothing would have happened. Yeah. Now, they're practically given death sentences. Which I am not approve. I'm not approving of vigilante politics, right, right. but I understand where it's coming from. Well, you know, Bill Cosby was sentenced yesterday. Um, well, he, was he was actually well. It was found guilty. Yeah. He was found found yeah, guilty. Was found guilty. Um, Which is a shock. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Donald Trump is in the White House, who kind of right. represents that, you know, grab him by the you-know-what, and now yeah. he's president. Yeah. So you have all that going on. Now, I went to high school in the 1970s. Oh. And I remember being a sensitive, bookish, shy kid. Uh, and none of the women looked at me. They all went for the jocks, you know. All the guys who were had testosterone coming out of their ears, you know. Oh, yeah. they, they were the big men, and I felt that was not fair, you know, in some way. It was, <laughs> I, I always felt like a victim of, in some way. But also, well, I, fair? well, that, because it seemed like the women were all gravitating toward these he-men, these yes, macho yes. men, you know. Oh. They, uh, and then I discovered uh, Alan Alda, as a role model on, on in movies, that he was a sensitive male, right? There was a there was a kind of movement that the men were benefiting from feminism. That we have a stake in this too. What we don't want to have to walk around as these 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 rigid, you know, uh, whatever, you know, we supermen all the time, you know. So I'm I'm. We'll see the benefit. Yeah. It's the great hope that men and women alike will yeah. see the benefit of women's rights, of uh, mm -hmm. equality for men and women alike. Yes. It's a liberation for mo both of us. Yes, indeed. I, I felt that from the very first moment I ever saw things in this light. So we have work to do. <laughs> oh, God, do we ever. <laughs> I want to uh, turn to your recent book, The Odd Woman of the City. I love that title, and the city, Odd Woman and the City, which has to do with your wanderings around New York and your relationship to New York, uh, which to me, like my relationship to New York is very complicated now. I both love it, and I'm finding, and maybe you could comment on this too, that in the city now it's becoming, uh, there's a certain sterility and the mom and pop shops are closing and uh, there's this book Vanishing New York 
that that's out about vanishing New York. Okay. <laughs> my take is yeah, yeah. I'm really I'm an old woman now. I've lived here my entire life. I've watched the city in this sense change repeatedly. Wow. And the fact of the matter is I hardly register the changes. Because for me, <laughs> the streets of New York are the heart of the city. For me, it's street theater. For me, it's encounters between, among human beings, among people. And so the buildings go up and down, the shops open and close. We have bad times, good times. I'm really sounding like Charles Dickens. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but the fact is, I'm one of those people. I just keep slogging through these streets. These And they're not mean to me. Oh. They're, they are, uh, the, uh, f for me, the, the life of the city, the heart of it is the constant, endless encounter between people. I walk out of this apartment into the street and I feel a charge, a renewal. I start walking and I am bound to have an encounter or overhear an, an exchange or see somebody doing something that lifts my heart and I, and I'm, I'm back in business. <laughs> I'm, uh. I'm in this, that's what that book was all about. Um, it is meant to show how people like myself, whose lives have turned out somewhat oddly, I don't have a family, I don't have a husband, I don't have children, I live alone, like millions of other people, and uh, it's from that perspective that I encounter the city. So for me, the city is a constant renewal, a refreshment, a revitalization. Uh, right? Got it? Yeah. Uh, and that's how I see New York. Vanishing New York? Yeah, it's vanished a hundred times since I was a kid. And when I was a child, you everything in New York was free, safe, and um, or cheap or available, um, right? And especially safe. That was the big, big thing. My mother was widowed when she was in her 40s, and that was in the late, late around 1950, in the 50s, and. Um, she went to work immediately, and she took the subway, which was four blocks away from our apartment. She went downtown to work in an office, and very often she stayed out afterwards, had dinner with uh, somebody, she a friend from work, or even went to a concert in the theater, got back on that subway at 11 o'clock at night, came back to the Bronx, walked those same four blocks at midnight oh. to our apartment, and nothing ever happened, and nobody ever thought, twice about it, and that was a huge uh, component of, uh, of good, f for the good in our lives, which is a terrible thing to have lost. That is a thing that has been lost, and also uh, nothing is free, <laughs> nothing is cheap. However, if you take a look at a photograph of downtown New York in 1950, you will see a street full of white men. All you see is a lot of hats and coats, and like a woman here and there, and no black people. Now you have that same photograph, and we're all visible. So there we are. Wow. I, I grew up in New Jersey in a small town called Edgewater, which is on the Hudson River. Very small town, woods in my backyard, but with a view of New York. Oh. So it was an interesting juxtaposition yeah. there, you know. But that also, the place you long to get to, to, get right? to it was the Oz, you know. Yeah, it was totally. Absolutely. But my grandmother, actually both of my grandparents uh, lived in New York. Mm -hmm. And my Hungarian grandmother, who I told you about, went to Walton High in the Bronx, then moved to Washington Heights, where she got married. My mom went to George Washington High School. And then the family all moved to Fort Lee, New Jersey. That was the thing to do, except one uncle, my Uncle Ali. He stayed on 169th and Broadway. <laughs> and he was like a real life Damon, Damon Runyon character. And I used to, when I was a teenager, go visit him. And it was the coolest thing to walk down Broadway. And it had a kind of whiff of danger. This was like in the 80s, but I was going to meet my cool Uncle Ali, you know, and so, and also watching home movies as a kid, black and white movies of uh, my, my, my parents, my, my mother, and my grandmother rolling my mother in the stroller in Washington Heights, and my grandparents at the World's Fair in 1938, so all of that was part of the romance, and uh, through your work now, I'm, I'm become I'm beginning to reappreciate yeah, okay. that that, that, yeah. that, that yeah. love. Yeah, no, it has never died. Okay. New York remains okay. one of the most, if not the most, vital city in the West. Mm. I don't think there's another capital that really can. Uh, 
uh, in which people feel as vital as the most ordinary person can feel on the streets of New York, as well as a million other things. But, um, um, yeah. We met in the movies. Yeah. We met at the oh, film yeah. forum, and this, uh, <laughs> actually it was a screening of the first feminist movie ever made. Um, I'm not sure. That was what they say. That are, uh, <laughs> are, uh, okay. But it's uh, certainly, it was, yeah, made in 1973. It was certainly one of the first. Year of the Woman, it was called. Yeah. Right. So, uh, any favorite movies about New York? Maybe? Or about New York? Or any movies in general or about New York, too? Or, well, yeah. that movie's not about New York. That movie was not about New York. No. no it was about the, the connection to Florida. And yeah, yeah, and yeah. and the earliest days of the Women's uh, yeah. the National Political Caucus. Any favorite movies about New York? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there are a lot of New York movies. Uh, I'd have to think about that. Okay. I can't come up with one r right now. I need a list. Yes. I never can. I can never come up with the one the one name that's required. What's your favorite this or that? I know. I know. Um, we were watching The Prisoner of Second Avenue the other day oh, with yeah. Jack Lemmon and that's Anne great. Bancroft. Well, yeah. That is a great New York movie. That captures a lot, and it's like a time capsule. It captures the, its moment brilliantly, especially the scene where. In Central Park, oh, where yeah. he, <laughs> mugged, not really by he mugs a kid, he, he thinks is running after him. <laughs> black kid or brown, I don't remember what the kid is, Latino or black. Yes. And he's convinced the kid is um, after him, and he in turn mugs him before. <laughs> that was Sylvester Stallone also. Oh, was it? His early roles, yeah. You're kidding. Oh. Yeah. oh, really? Why did I remember him as, oh, well. Dark enough. Um, yeah, but the I, psychological significance of that for Jack Lemmon, for the character, was that he fought back. Yes. He fought back. But also, the, the city has made him criminal. The city has made him insane. <laughs> <laughs> He's a, he is, a, yeah. They, they, there. But that is a brilliant way. Uh -huh. That that um, reveals a brilliant way in which you could have experienced the city, certainly in the 70s, yes. um, as um, as uh, c full of criminal intent. Full of of um, of um, threat and um, and fearfulness. Mm. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I went right through it without feeling any of those things. <laughs> now, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Even even though my mother got mugged twice, even if we got mugged, I still never. I never felt the city had become my enemy ever. I, ne I uh, That's essentially it. Yeah. So the city, in a way, keeps you sane. Absolutely, no question about that. There's no question about that. I depend upon it to. Uh, oh. I depend upon it for uh, for constant revitalization. New York and reading. <laughs> those, oh, those, those are the two, things, two my, things. My 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 two resources for um, for constantly um, renewing myself and uh, oh. and and keeping myself sane. Yeah. So on our way here, Claudia and I, we took the PATH train from Hoboken, and uh, then we strolled over to the Roasting Plant Cafe, which is right over here. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, then we uh, came over here to your apartment, and I noticed these two young ladies carrying a plant. It looked very strange. This was an odd encounter, you know. They had on the, 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 on the street. They had this big flower pot, and it looked like a, a palm tree coming uh -huh. out of it. And they were like coming right in front of your house at the time we were approaching. So I had to be curious, and I said, "Oh, what kind of plant is that?" And they didn't know. And they said, "We're trying to save this plant." <laughs> and with that, we all strode together in front of your awning. <laughs> with the, you know, so okay. like you, Where were they, they were on their way someplace uh, yeah. with the plant. With the plant, they were saving a plant yeah. that they weren't sure if it was a palm tree or not. Claudia says it wasn't a palm no, tree. No, but not it looked palm, palm tree-ish. But it sort of uh, affirms your theory that if you're open to these moments, you can have a conversation with anybody over anything, <laughs> any any time. There is, I I think there is hardly ever a time yes. when. If you open your mouth and, and approach somebody, that they don't respond. That uh, I've hardly ever experienced uh, someone looking at me coldly uh, or suspiciously. For the most part, people are happy to respond. I can stand on the corner and turn to someone and say, can you believe that? <laughs> and in two minutes, I'm in a conversation. <laughs> yeah. What, could you talk about your teaching life at all in terms of like, are you enjoying it? Like, where are you teaching your... I hate teaching. Really? Okay. Yeah. Honest, yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? What, is, what is it about teaching that you don't like? Or yeah. 
Actually, I was the wrong one. I, I have taught in MFA programs. Uh, I, I am, there are two kinds of people who teach in MFA programs, loosely speaking, boosters and detractors. And I'm a detractor. I'm not a believer in the MFA programs. Um, I'm not. And therefore, it has really been rather immoral, if not amoral, of me to have taught. Because Philip will tell you this Philip <laughs> about <Lee>. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he is a great, uh, Philip, our, our mutual friend, Philip Lobet, yes. I'm happy to plug. He's a great, great teacher of writing. He, he, yeah. he has a passion for it. He's a true educator. Uh, he's a great believer in uh, both the uh, what he teaches and in, and in the students. I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> I am not a believer in it. Um, I'm 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 really not. And therefore, I have always uh, found teaching writing rather exasperating. So if God is good to me, I'll never teach again. And if God is good to my potential students, I'll never teach again. I can't imagine I've ever done anybody very much good um, because I have always, um, I'm not an encourager. I don't look for what's good, which is very necessary. I don't look for the good, I look for the problems. Yeah. And, um, and you know, you can take that or not, but um, I, I, I do believe that you should believe in the subject and the method and the process of what you teach, if you teach. And uh, I don't. Well, um, I, I think um, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, I, you, you, I think you set a great example just by your work and by your presence. Look how, look how alive you are, how exuberant in the world. Like, if you want to be a writer, folks, this is how you get to be. <laughs> Like this. <laughs> Am I alive, Gloria? Yeah. Oh, okay, go on. Exuberant and in this beautiful apartment in Greenwich Village. And uh, can we take a look at the apartment just a little? Uh, turn the camera. Oh my good, this is a beautiful place. This is a dream apartment. And uh, what do you, you like? like the bookshelf. The bookshelf. Oh, yeah. oh, Show the bookshelf. Yeah. It's important. Reading is important, folks. I do not have anywhere near as many books as many other writers do. Uh, oh, but don't worry. Yeah. It's not a competition. Yeah. Claudia, show outside, too, because I want the, re the viewers to see where we came from. Claudia and I live right across yeah. the Hudson yeah. River, and you can actually look out this window um, in Greenwich Village and see the... You live near Stevens? We live, uh, yeah, Hoboken is one square mile, Hoboken, so yes, it's like, it's very walkable. Yeah. Yeah, so yes. I have the encounters that you have in New York, I have them in Hoboken as well, and, and in New York. It's more homogeneous in Hoboken. It is, in a way. Yeah, you're right. I, I find that I'm critical of yeah. that, too. Yeah, it's yeah. white and middle class. Isn't too it? much, too much bourgeois. Well. You know, but I, you know, we, we, we try to always look for the good, and I try to escape and come to New York. No matter of good or bad. Yeah. It is what it is. It's heterogeneous, yeah. I have to use this language. You have to train me. Why? Well, I don't know. Oh, which language? Uh, you know, heterogeneous. When well, you want to be more precise. Precise. I'm being you schooled. Be more precise. Yes, yes I'm being <laughs> schooling. But we, but we don't want to use too much jargon because we don't use jargon. We, at you all. and I don't. But I was at a conference yesterday at NYU. It was on critical. It was on theory and criticism now, and I thought I had landed on another planet, Vivian. They were talking. I have no idea. I, I teach English. I'm a writer. And what do you, what do you think about that jargon? You really want me to rehearse? Please tell me. No, okay. <laughs> you said that earlier. So. Uh, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> critical thought and theory related to literature um, has a perfect right to exist. <laughs> uh, right. Many, many uh, brilliant people. Uh, uh, and thoughtful people and enthusiastic people partake in the life of critical thought. It is a special language that is used and in essence most of these people are talking to each other. Not to themselves, to each other. And they represent or they embody a, a real constituency. And that constituency has a huge effect upon um, the historical life of reading of reading and writing. So as where we can't understand what they are saying, because they are theorists and they do speak jargon, that's all right. Um, they, as I have said before, they will have students who will somehow manage to become middle, middle people. Uh, they will translate for those who cannot 
understand theory, um, the good of what is being done there. I do not suspect theorists of being empty and self-serving, which is the implication in our criticisms. You know, I don't believe that. However, I do believe they do need translators. Yes. Wow. Well, we. Where did you go? Uh, because Stanley Fish invited me. Sta Stanley Fish is Stanley Fish. Stanley Fish. We had him on our show, on show? and he's going to be there. So we invited, and I went. But I, I'm, I'm still kind of glad I went because you want to know what's going on. But Stanley Fish is an interesting character, also. Yes, he's he quite a person himself. Well, he's a definite mediator. Yes. He himself is a great mediator. Stanley knows. He can speak in a language that is accessible. Stanley Fit, absolutely, yeah. which he does and, and has very often and very often to the good. Yeah. And here's what he said yesterday, which I. Your program, he certainly wasn't talking jargon. No, not at all. No. He was the shining light. He was, he was the only star who was like like known person uh, on the panel. You had a panel? It was, it was a panel. Pound? Yeah, at NYU. It was oh, at a, NYU. It was, it was, with, with, with Stanley one on one, we just had him one on one. That was uh, on, what day was that, Claudia? Yeah, that was uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. We had then the next day was the, the or panel. was the panel. So, uh, but the thing. So what was he talking about on your show? Um, just the uh, kind of thing similar with. things. Yeah, about it's the the crisis in the humanities, oh. the crisis in the humanities. That Stanley and crisis. Stanley feels there is, and Stanley feels that uh, there's no hope. Or. <laughs> 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 he said there's very little hope. He said unless we can figure out... Meaning what? That the humanities will die out? Yeah, because he said unless us... As a field of study? People, because yeah. they're marginalizing it. They're cutting the programs and they're putting in business and technology and all that stuff. But he's stuff. been saying this for 30 years. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but he's asking us now if we can figure out how to market this. If we can get the word out in a way that resonates with the money people that they could say, oh, yeah, you're right. This should be supported. He doesn't think it's very uh, possible. And I tried to make the argument that maybe our show could be helpful. Uh -huh. Well, what do you think? You'll see. Uh, we're trying with this. Well, you've had, this show has aired already, the one with Stanley? The one with Stanley, no. That's going to air this week. Oh. And then, then you're going to follow Stanley. Right. And, uh, <laughs> maybe we'll get the two of you together yeah. on the couch over here, maybe. We'll just keep building the circle, maybe. I'm sure he would frown on me. Really? Yeah, I think maybe maybe not. What do I know? Stanley is a curmudgeon, and he admits it, and he likes his cantankerous. Yes, yes, because yes. one of the things he said at the at the conference, he wrote, he wrote a column for the Times for a long time, yes. and it was very content. It was really yeah. cantankerous, and yeah, and very hmm. useful. Uh, yeah. it, many of the things he said were were very useful, because they are prodding, and they mm. they bring out um, um, they bring out the um, you know they re revivify the mm. question, bring out the color in everybody's antagonistic cheeks. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. He, no, he's good. He's good. Good. Yeah. I, I, well, I'd be very curious to learn what effect his talk uh, on the dying humanities will have. You get a lot of response, I take it, from your well, like we said, we people have stopped us on the streets, yeah. and I've been recognized in like every neighborhood in the city. But our well, show how is you get response if you were people could email us. We always welcome people do? to. They don't, but we want, would like some feedback. <laughs> is anyone alive out there? We want to. No. <laughs> we're trying to break through. We're trying to break through with how the show. How does a television program discover whether or not it's being listened? What to? we really need is money, Vivian, because we need we need people to know who we are. Everything in this life is money. Charlie Rose shows like that had money, so they could go out to a big audience well, or a big they network. That they had a, a, a listenership out there. I, I don't know. I'm not a good marketer. You see, I, I come out of literature. I come out of th those education field and you talk to some of the television people you deal with. No or no? I need to do that more. We need to get more savvy with that kind of thing. But it's it sort of goes against my grain because um, I try to be more of an intellectual than a, than a marketer. Everybody today is a marketer, and I. I haven't been able to brand myself, as they say, you know, but this is who we are, this is what we do. Yeah. And, uh, I have nothing to say on that one. <laughs> yeah. But we do, like you say, we have a mutual friend and Mr. Philip Lope. Yes, we do. Who was a dear, dear person. Um, do you have any other, like, writer friends or people you bounce ideas off of who are special uh, or any academic friends? Or well, yeah, sure. Okay. Any, any we want to talk no. or you know? Okay, okay. Right. <laughs> go ahead. Claudia has a question. Okay. I want to know how you got involved with the uh, women of the year. Um, 
movie. Okay, Claudia wants to know how you got involved with that movie called uh, oh. The Year of the Woman, a 1973 film that... The Film Forum asked me. The Film Forum, Bruce uh, Gold, uh, Goldstein, yes. at the Film Forum asked me to do this, mm -hmm. to do a Q&A with Sandra Hockman, whom I did not know. Yeah. I had never met her. Yeah, even though we were both alive and doing what we were doing in the 70s, I was this earnest little girl at the Village Voice, uh, you know, writing my earnest articles, and she was out there doing what she was out there doing. So well, we did not know each other. It was because of the film forum. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you decide on what to write, and like in terms of, oh. it's a tough question, there's right? No, it's just, there's no answer. To there that. is no answer. It's whatever you, it yeah. speaks to you at the time, what exactly. you feel. Exactly. It's hard to. Okay. Well, you and I have something in common in terms of uh, this connection between life and art, because I wrote a book. I wrote a book in 2009 called "My Life as a Novel," mm -hmm. and I wanted to really make a point that real life can be or should be as interesting as the characters we encounter in books or uh, the f characters we see in films. Uh, very often, people go through the day feeling bored. I'm against boredom. I mean, I, I try to teach against boredom. I think I think boredom has become an epidemic in our society. This is just one of my theories, but I think one reason Trump was elected is because of political boredom. People just got tired of hearing all the blah blah blah, same old, same old. This guy is, is, seems like a character. He's in, he's in his own way. He's engaging. He's very vivid. He's very alive and in the moment, and he speaks off the top of his head. So I think we've just become bored to death. So as what are you saying, book? How are you urging? Is this a how-to book? How Not a how-to. No. It was for me to become less bored. Yeah. Oh, what? It was for me to become less bored. Yeah, I was bored. I was, I, I'm bored at times, yeah. I'm bored when I sit in a cafe and I look around and everybody on laptops. And is, yeah, I find it hard sometimes to get into a conversation in a society that's becoming more corporatized, where the work week is, is getting... I, I've, I've commented on that, too. And my, my, and my, what was the book? You said you wrote a book. Called my Life as a Novel, but the subtitle is Manifesto on the Activist as Hero and Other Ways to Not Be Bored. So part of my theory is that by being an activist, by be engaging in the world and trying to make the world better, you... It was a kind of polemic. It was, it was a urging your readers to become activists. Yeah, in a way, yes and no. I was just sort of naming my world, naming my world as as uh, was for me. Because as a teacher, I've always been a teacher activist. I teach for democracy, and my as I when I teach English, we we set up the chairs in a circle, and uh, we create a democratic space. Because I went to a very radical program at NYU in English education, where uh, we learned about people like John Dewey and the connection between democracy and education. So so my classrooms are like laboratories for social justice, just naturally. Um, and uh, I wanted to get that word. And I think teaching is becoming less like that. I think I think education is becoming more more corporate, uh, more um, teach the test kind of thing, right? So my my teaching is a radical revolutionary act, and this program at NYU trained me to to do that. And I'm just trying to say, folks, this is what I do. This is my work. So my writing is a way of saying this is my work. And uh, and, and 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 Philip Lopez was one of my inspirations because he came out of that 1970s culture. He wrote a book called Being with Children, where it's it, it's it's you reviewed that book. Yes, I reviewed that book for the Times. That's how we became friends. Uh, so it's interesting. We, you and I both went to NYU, but I stumbled I, in. You, I oh thought, yeah, I did. Yeah, actually, did I forgot. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I took an MA, an MA, right, an MA there. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll just drop one other big name, if I could, Lu Louise Rosenblatt. Yeah, nobody knows her. She's uh, the most. Really big name. She was the most important literary critic of, uh, in terms of education and democracy. Uh, she went to Barnard, uh, where she studied anthropology, and she was Margaret Mead's roommate. Then she went to uh, the um, <coughs> Sorbonne, and she got a she got a, a doctorate in uh, in comparative literature. And then she stayed in Paris, and she hung around uh, Andre Gide and Marcel Duchamp. And then she came back to New York and she wrote a book called Literature is Exploration. Um, and where she talks about how talking about literature is also connected to the health of a democracy. She made that linkage. And if you talk about literature in an open way, where you're having a real 
discussion where you're sharing your feelings and that that's quite that is a that is a practice for living in a democratic society this book was revolutionary in the field of English education in the field of and, and she lived to be a hundred years old and she founded the program at NYU in 1947 that I attended in the mid 1990s the, 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 yeah so and I, I, I had one of her students Gordon Pradle as my teacher so this is all breaking news to most people because a, except for people in the field of yeah. English that she was like the star, you know, Louise Rosenblatt, she would go to conferences and speak before hundreds of people. She was lionized and yet her work has been marginalized because it's too radical, it's too democratic. So I, I'm sort of wrestling with this myself in terms of politics and, and writing and art and I, I, I'm sort of getting tired of the politics though. It's getting very exhausting. Okay. Yeah, yes. And did you find a similar dynamic where you, in terms of the uh, early feminist movement and you were very out there with politics and then you shift in some way and move away from politics? How do you move toward and away from politics or are you still with politics 100%? And I have a strong sense of the politicalness of life. I always have had. Yes. It is from that perspective that almost everything in my life has taken place. But it turns out I was not an activist. Mm. I was a writer. So the politicalness of life in terms of feminism <coughs> influences everything I write. Mm. Other than that, I've lived my life as a writer, not as a professional feminist activist. Is that clear? Yes. yes. So uh, we have a few minutes left, so uh, what, what would you say you would like to talk about? What would you like to talk about next? <laughs> I, I, uh, okay. I, um, I, I don't, y you, you have to make a suggestion. I have no particular thing I want to talk about. No, I know that, that's not a direct question. Claudia, uh, what? What is your future work? What's your next upcoming project? Yeah, yeah. I'm in the middle of writing a book about rereading. I am rereading many of the books that I loved as a young woman or a much younger woman uh, and uh, writing about how I have changed and the culture has changed and the book has changed mm. through that prism. So that's what I'm doing. Well, good luck with that, uh, Vivian. Good luck with all your wanderings around the city and in your conversations and on your work. And it's such an honor to meet you, and it's a pleasure. I'm so, but, uh, you know, feminism, it's important. We want to keep it going strong. I, I, am, a, I am a feminist male, okay? I, I, Claudia, I, I do the dishes sometimes, right? No, I do the dishes a lot. I, you see, I do do the dishes. Okay, so thank you so much. With Vivian Gornick, one of the great writers of our time, uh, one of the great memoirists, it was such a pleasure and delight to be with you here in your Greenwich Village apartment, and thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Okay. okay. Thank you.